Welcome to another episode of the Dongfeng Hour YouTube channel. As it's the end of the year, in this episode, we are going to present to you the top eight trends and highlights of the Chinese space sector in 2021, ranging from space exploration, from launch, from constellations, all the way to satellite applications. Happy 2022, and let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfeng Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So leading highlight on the list of 2021 major Chinese space events is China's announcement with its partner, Russia of the ambitious ILRS project, also known as the International Lunar Research Station, which is China and Russia's equivalent of the Artemis program. And that would basically take place over the next 15 to 20 years in three phases. There'd be the reconnaissance, the construction and the utilization phases. And this project includes ambitious goals such as lunar resources, mining, in-situ resources, utilization, energy harvesting, and perhaps more ambitiously putting enabling Chinese and Russian astronauts to set foot on the moon sometime in the 2030s. Now, perhaps more interestingly, from a geopolitical point of view, China and Russia through this project are actually offering an alternative to the U.S.-led Artemis program, which is the other very ambitious lunar exploration program, which has had a head start of a couple of years. And noteworthily, I think the offer coming from China and Russia can be considered as rather a convincing one. And this is because of the strong financial backing coming from China. Um, also, China's recent successes with the Chang'e 5 lunar mission and Tianwen 1 shows that it is able to do very sophisticated deep space exploration missions. And you also have Russia's decades long experience in space technology. Now, of course, the question will be, will China and Russia actually be able to convince third countries to join the ILRS? And that's especially with China, which has basically a track record of mostly national space projects, although it does have some bilateral collaborations with um, other countries in space, but it still remains very modest compared to what European countries, for example, are doing. And on the other side, we have Italy, Australia, the UK, Japan, South Korea, Brazil, New Zealand, Poland, the UAE, Ukraine, and more recently, Mexico that have all signed the Artemis Accords. And so they'll probably have a varying level of involvement in the Artemis program. So it'll be interesting to watch if and who China and Russia will be able to attract into the ILRS program. There's no countries so far. There have been rumors and talks of uh, possibly interest coming from France, Italy, Saudi Arabia and Thailand and also the European Space Agency. But so far, no one has made an official move, so we'll probably have to wait until 2022 at the very least to see that. And that's naturally also because the ILRS is a very young program. It was just announced um, in June 2021 this year. So that's for the first highlight linked to lunar exploration. But moving to number two, in parallel of all of those preparations and announcements about the moon, history was also being made on Mars. And indeed, three historic missions NASA's Mars 2020 mission, the UAE's Hope mission, and of course, China's Tianwen 1 mission, all made it to Mars early in 2021. And while Hope and Mars 2020 were absolutely fascinating in, in many regards, the focus of this episode naturally will be more on Tianwen 1. So the Tianwen 1 mission is composed of an orbiter, of a lander and a rover named Zhurong. And the orbiter successfully, I mean, the Tianwen 1 mission in its entirety successfully reached Mars on February 2021 after a six month trip and after a reconnaissance phase of a couple of months during which the spacecraft basically remained in the orbit around Mars, the orbiter then released uh, the lander carrying the Jurong rover on May the 15th. And after that, the lander basically entered the Martian atmosphere successfully. It successively braked aerodynamically. It deployed its supersonic parachutes and also used retropropulsion to touch down softly. And ever since, the Jurong rover has been roaming the Martian ground in the region of Utopia Planitia and has driven 1,253 meters by November 8, 2021. And so this mission Tianwen 1 has, you know, is historical for China for several reasons. The first one is that it's China's first fully independent deep space exploration mission. So basically beyond the Earth's orbit and lunar orbit. And for this reason, it is highly symbolic. And I think the second one is that 
This mission, Tianwen One, makes China the second country only to have ever achieved to put a rover safely on the surface of Mars. The first country being the United States, but we've had、uh, European missions and Russian missions having failed to do so for various technical reasons. And final point, I think that's quite noteworthy with the Tianwen One mission is just the breadth of the mission. And as the Chinese often like to remind their domestic and also international viewers. The Tianwen One mission accomplished putting an orbiter around Mars, landing a lander, and a rover all in one mission. This is something that was done through separate missions by other spacefaring nations, and this is probably what we can call the latecomer's advantage, where China was able to learn from the experience of other spacefaring nations. I think ultimately, this、uh, the Tianwen One mission symbolizes China's transition from a catch-up phase in space exploration to a phase where it is attempting things. That have not been attempted before, and a typical example is that its next Mars mission will be a Mars sample return mission, which is something that will be attempted also by NASA and ESA for the first time by the end of the decade. So I think the next decade is going to be absolutely fascinating in space exploration on the Moon, on Mars, but also just further down the solar system. So,、um, Blaine, do you want to tell us about highlight number three? Sure thing. So the third highlight of the year in the Chinese space sector has been the emergence and ascendance of China Satellite Networks Limited and its constellation Guowang. To give a little bit of background, the last couple of years have seen a pretty rapid acceleration in the deployment of the Starlink constellation from SpaceX, and over that time, we have heard from various industry pundits and, in some cases, official sources in the Chinese space sector about a sort of Chinese response to Starlink. That being, you know, a ten or fifteen thousand satellite. Low Earth orbit broadband constellation, and 2021 definitely saw those plans take a pretty big step forward. So in April of this year, we saw the establishment of China Satellite Networks Group Limited, or Zhongguo Weixing Wangluo Jituan Youxing Gongse, and this is a state-owned enterprise established at a very high level of the state-owned enterprise hierarchy. So basically, the same level as Kask and Kasik, the two big aerospace and space companies, and sort of just under the central state-owned asset supervision and administration council, or SASAC. And so, basically, this company is is tasked with deploying the Chinese response to Starlink. And we don't have a very firm timeline or a you know a confirmed number of satellites, but ITU filings by China from late 2020 have suggested some you know more than 10,000 satellites for this constellation. And so, the creation of this China Satellite Networks Limited or China SatNet in April of last year, or sorry, April of this year, as it were.、Um, I think it, it certainly implies a very high level of support for this idea of having a global broadband constellation.、Uh, a company like Satnet, as I mentioned, is at the same level of the hierarchy as Kask and Kasich, and that should, at least in theory, give it a higher level of autonomy over who it wants to buy satellites from or who it wants to buy launch services from, and, and basically allow it to be a bit more independent in terms of its procurement, which I think is going to be very important when it's trying to build. This sort of broadband internet network、uh, from space, as it were, and just a couple of other small points about Satnet.、Um, so the company is headquartered in Xiong'an, which is the sort of new planned city to the south of Beijing. It is the only state-owned enterprise that is high,、uh, that is headquartered there.、Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's no formal timeline that's been laid out for the deployment of this constellation Guowang, but we assume that over the course of 2022, we're going to start to see more test satellites launched. And、um, the last couple of points related to China's response to start. Starlink this year, we've seen an increasing number of commercial companies that are manufacturing satellites、uh, report updates on their manufacturing capabilities. So the most noteworthy would have been Kasik, which、um, last month presented some updates on their satellite factory in Wuhan.、Uh, but we've also seen companies like Gee Space or Comsat or Galaxy Space report an increase in the number of satellites they're able to manufacture, or otherwise report、uh, that their sort of satellite factories are nearing completion、um, as we get towards the end of the year. So. Uh, definitely, 2021. We've seen a lot of activity around this sort of China's response to Starlink and this deploying of a large low Earth orbit broadband constellation, and、uh, you know, building the subsequent infrastructure that's required to do that. One last concept that we've seen in 2021 related to this low Earth orbit broadband constellation is the concept of Tongdao Yao Itihua, or the integration of Earth observation, satellite navigation. And communication satellites,、uh, and indeed,、um, separate to the low Earth orbit broadband constellation, the sort of Chinese reply to Starlink, we saw Earth observation and more specifically SAR or synthetic aperture radar satellites as another main trend in 2021. Indeed, synthetic aperture radar or SAR Earth observation satellites 
were probably the main Earth observation related trend in 2021. So just a very short review. So SAR or synthetic aperture radar satellites use radar technology as opposed to optical technology uh, and the movement of the satellite relative to the Earth to gather observation data about what is on the surface. So basically you have a very different type of remote sensing satellite relative to the traditional optical EO satellites. And 2021 has seen really this interesting convergence of different factors that have caused SAR to become a much hotter topic. So in the Chinese context, we saw at the very end of 2020, the launch of the first C-band SAR Earth observation satellite by a commercial company, that being the HISA-1 satellite launched by SpaceCity and the CETC 38th Institute. And the timing of this satellite ended up being pretty perfect with early 2021 seeing the MS Ever Given, that large Taiwanese uh, container ship being caught in the Suez Canal and creating a lot of uh, interesting and unusual opportunities for Earth observation companies to get photos of this ship and uh, you know market those photos as an example of the quality of images that they were capturing. And later on in the year, just a few months after that, we saw SAR satellites and also Earth observation satellites more generally playing a major role in capturing and transmitting data around the floods in uh, in Henan province in, in the Zhengzhou area. And this, I think, made a number of different satellites um, you know, rather more high profile among the Chinese public, uh, notably the Gaofun-3, which is one of China's large sort of state-operated SAR satellites. And as the year went on, we saw a couple of other related developments to, to SAR. So that included the announcement of a Chinese commercial SAR constellation, uh, the 96 satellite uh, Tianxian constellation, which was to be developed by SpaceD and the CETC 38th Institute, um, as well as a four satellite SAR constellation announced by PiSat, which is a publicly traded uh, Earth observation data analytics company. Um, and finally, a Silk Road SAR constellation being developed by the company Smart Satellite in collaboration with the government of Tongchuan City in, uh, in Shanxi province. So basically just several commercial SAR constellations having been announced or otherwise advanced during the course of 2021. And just to round out the year in the SAR sphere, we also did see two Tianhui-2 satellites that were launched uh, by this and that were developed by the CETC 14th Institute, both of which are using SAR technology for 3D topographic mapping. Um, so yeah, it's uh, certainly a, um, not a topic that gets a huge amount of, uh, of play in, in the media, but, but definitely SAR was, uh, was a, a major topic in the Chinese space sector in 2020. So, Jean, that's a lot of talk about SAR. Shall we move on to a, a somewhat more uh, exciting topic of uh, commercial launch? Absolutely. Moving to highlight number five, which is that 2021 was a significant year for a Chinese launch, but it probably could have been bigger. So on paper, it seems that 2021 was an extraordinary year for launch, and it arguably is in many regards. There were 53 launches at the time of shooting of this video performed by China in 2021. China literally shatters its previous record of 39 launches in 2019 and takes the lead, leaving the U.S. behind at 45 launches. And that's saying something considering that really, you know, SpaceX has been pumping out Starlink satellites and has been deploying them into low Earth orbit. Although I'd note that 45 Launches is also a very honorable number with, um, you know, both, you know, 45 and 53 representing roughly 25 to 30 percent of launches internationally for the U.S. and for China. Now, behind this massive number of 53 launches for China, there are actually several trends. There are two trends. I think the first one is just the burgeoning Chinese National Space Program, which represents the overwhelming majority of these 53 launches. Uh, and there were launches of many high profile payloads, for example, the Tianhe-Wen core module of the Chinese space station. And there were also many crewed and cargo missions that followed. There were science missions such as the solar mission Chase, as well as the Guangmu satellite. There were many civil and military Earth observation satellites launched, such as uh, the Galfen and the Yaogan. There were communication satellites such as Tiantong and Tianlian. And I'm, of course, uh, missing a lot of others. And also equally impressive in 2021 were the various details that were provided on future lunar rockets, such as the Long March 5 DY and the Long March 9. So really a very big year for the Chinese national launch program. Now, the second trend and perhaps the more disappointing one 
concerns the Chinese commercial launch sector. And 2021, to be honest, should have been an absolutely crazy year for Chinese commercial launch because we were expecting initially uh, the maiden launch of the ZQ2, the Hyperbola 2Z, the Tianlong 1. All of them are medium lift liquid fueled rockets, which aim at being reusable a little bit a la SpaceX, performing vertical takeoff and vertical landing. But none of these launches took place. I mean, this doesn't mean that 2021 was all bad. There were some significant milestones that were achieved, such as Deep Blue Aerospace, a commercial launch company performing 100 meter altitude hops with one of their prototype rockets. And we also saw the comeback of some presumed dead companies such as OneSpace and LinkSpace. But overall, 2021 from a commercial launch perspective was rather disappointing compared to our initial expectations. Now, of course, the corollary of saying that is that 2022 is going to be absolutely insane, right? Because we're going to have the maiden launches normally of all the rockets that I just mentioned earlier, but we also have the maiden launch of the rockets that were already planned for 2022. So you have to add to the list the maiden launch of the ZK-1A, the Darwin-1 rocket, the Jelong-3 rocket, and possibly the Nebula-1 rocket. So honestly, if all of those rockets really launch in 2022, I think there's a good chance that in the future we look back at 2022 and we consider that to be, you know, really the dawn of Chinese commercial launch. Now, of course, um, launching rockets, it's nice, but it's nothing if you don't have the correct launch infrastructure. And that brings us to our next highlight, highlight number six. Indeed. And yeah, 2022 is shaping up to be a heck of a year for Chinese commercial launch. But getting to your point about Chinese launch infrastructure that we saw over the course of 2021, I think looking back, we're going to see 2021 as the year that China really started to diversify its launch infrastructure. And so just a quick overview. Uh, historically, there have been four and I guess up until 2013-ish, there were only three uh, launch sites in China. The four launch sites have been tightly controlled by the military, but also access to them is, is sort of, um, you know, you have the traditional cask and Kasich type companies that that don't necessarily want to make it easy for commercial launch companies to access these launch sites. And over 2021, I think we've seen this really significant change in philosophy towards commercial launch sites. And so we saw really three, at least, separate commercial launch sites that were given a lot of public support. And we've indeed seen some more tangible results from these launch sites over the course of 2021. So the first one I think that's worth mentioning is the commercial launch site that was mentioned in China's 14th five-year plan published earlier this year. And while it is not specifically mentioned in the national level 14th five-year plan that it will be a launch site in Ningbo, Zhejiang province, we do believe it will be a launch site in Ningbo in Zhejiang. This first one being built in Xiangshan in Ningbo uh, seems to have the support of the Zhejiang provincial government and it is also very close to the Yangtze River Delta, which is an area that they have a, a large um, a large cluster of launch vehicle integration facilities being built. Um, the second one that, that I think is, is maybe even more interesting when you consider the type of things that are involved is the one in Shandong province, uh, which has been home to a number of different updates. So this has included um, primarily some uh, facilities at what's called the Oriental Seaport or the uh, Dongfang Hang Tiangang. Uh, and this is in Yantai in, uh, in Shandong province. And so over the course of 2021, we've seen a fully assembled ZK-1A rocket from Caspace uh, being set up in Yantai. We've also had a, an interesting Juche 2 sighting from some internet sleuths at the Yantai uh, Oriental Seaport. And we've seen, we saw an October signing ceremony uh, with a couple of other companies that were setting up facilities at this, uh, this Oriental Seaport. And notably, we also did see a sea launch component from this Shandong uh, Yantai Oriental Seaport where they were developing a new type of ship that was 162.5 meters long by 40 meters wide. Again, this, this second commercial spaceport around Shandong province, we had really not heard about very much up until 2021. Um, Finally, if we look in the southern part of the country, we saw some commercial developments around the Wenchang Space Center in Hainan. And so Wenchang is the one of these three that I've mentioned that was previously well established. As I mentioned, there's a there's a state owned launch facility there. It's where China launches its large rockets, the Long March 5 uh, and 7 and 8, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and, and over the course of 2021, we've seen some increased commercial activity and what have been sort of hints at a new commercial launch site uh, in or near Wenchang. 
And so this included uh, seeing iSpace set up a subsidiary in Wenchang near the launch site. And during the opening ceremony of this subsidiary, the company discussed with the local government a desire to develop the sort of launch in, uh, launch manufacturing sector in Wenchang in Hainan province. Uh, we also saw later on in the year an interview with the general manager of Cast Space, which has their large launch integration facility set up. Uh, in Nansha in Guangzhou, so in the su southern part of the country, pretty close to Wenchang by boat. Um, we saw the general manager Hu Xiaowei discussing how you know it would be possible to uh, to ship rockets from Guangzhou down to Hainan to Wenchang for launch. So ultimately, at the end of the year, China's, uh, China's launch infrastructure remains these four large state-controlled launch sites. But I do think that we will look back at 2021 and say this was the year where you know commercial launch sites first started to see significant high level support. And I think these three commercial launch sites are going to be um, something to keep an eye on moving forward, definitely. So um, so in 2021, similar to the West, where we saw Blue Origin and SpaceX capture people's imaginations by sending tourists into space, um, the idea of space tourism has become a little bit more mainstream in China. Uh, so the most recent example of this would be just a couple of weeks ago, a Chinese cryptocurrency multimillionaire called Justin Sun, I think Sun Yu Chen, booked a flight on a Blue Origin rocket for 2022, and he will bring five tourists with him. Um, but more directly related to Chinese space over the course of 2021, we saw iSpace and Caspace announce plans for what could be considered sort of a Chinese new shepherd. Both of those companies are developing their own of those. While Space Transportation, which is a more kind of, uh, well, space transportation as it were company, um, completed multiple funding rounds as well as a handful of test flights of its Tianxing series of supersonic space planes, uh, while also announcing plans for a suborbital space tourism space plane. And so these types of uh, plans of, again, uh, space tourism and suborbital space planes have been met with increasing financial support over 2021. We've seen space transportation raise a few hundred million RMB during the year, and also Cast Space has raised quite a bit of money um, for what, again, is kind of a Chinese New Shepherd type of concept. And we've seen, I think, multiple companies kind of straddling the line between space tourism and hypersonic planes and other related technologies with what might be considered a future intention to pivot. And I think this is something that we've also seen among Chinese satellite manufacturers, for example, where these companies talked about wanting to have a constellation while also wanting to build satellites for other constellations. And this has left them some kind of nimbleness and ability to pivot into different business areas as regulations evolve and as different areas become you know, less... Um, less prone to, to regulations, let's say. So So I think you, you see companies such as space transportation that are talking about doing a variety of different things that are you know, tangentially related to space tourism or suborbital space planes, etc. And I think that part of that could be this um, you know, wanting to pivot as regulations evolve, because right now it's still not entirely clear. Um, so that's all from my side, John. I think you have one more update on the year, and it's probably the most ambitious and interesting one of the, uh, of the age. So Tell us about the Chinese space station. Absolutely. So the last big event of the Chinese space sector in 2021, I think, is the construction of the Chinese space station. And just to put that a little bit into perspective, this represents the culmination of 30 years of work of China's Project 921, which is the name that was given to their crewed spaceflight program. And just a quick retrospective on Project 921. This is a project that started out in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And there was this first phase where the Chinese developed a human rated rocket, the Long March 2F, and a crewed spacecraft, the Shenzhou, uh, which is basically an upgraded version of the Soyuz spacecraft. And this Phase was successfully concluded in 2003 with the launch of the Taikonaut Yangli Wei. And then the next phase of Project 921 spanned from the mid 2000s to roughly 2017, uh, which aimed at gathering technologies to enable human activity in low Earth orbit. And so this consisted in building experimental space stations, the Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2, as well as cargo spacecraft, practicing space rendezvous and docking, designing a spacesuit and performing spacewalks, among other things. And finally, in 2021, so this year, the third phase has begun, the actual construction of the permanent Chinese space station. This phase will last about two years, so there'll be this closing here now in 2021, and this phase will be completed next year. The Tiangong Space Station is composed of three modules. We have the core module called the Tianhe One, and there are also two experimental modules called Wentian and Mengtian. So the core module is sort of the, the main control center in the living quarters, and it hosts the main propulsion compartment. 
Well, the experimental modules Mengtian and Wengtian extend the capabilities of the core module and of the space station. So the core module was launched this year in April 2021, and since then it has been visited by two teams of Taikonauts on two separate Shenzhou missions, and of which the last team actually of three Taikonauts are still on board, and they're planning to complete a six-month stay. And actually, they completed an EVA, a spacewalk, just a couple of days ago. And finally, there were two cargo missions, the Tianzhou 2 and Tianzhou 3, which docked with a space station delivering equipment and food and water supplies for the Taikonauts. So overall, this represented five launches related to China's crewed spaceflight program this year, which is an unprecedented rhythm and dynamic compared to um, how human spaceflight was going on in the Chinese space sector in the past few decades. And it will be followed by six launches next year, which will complete the construction of the space station. So the Tiangong space station represents uh, to date the second space station in service at the moment around the Earth after, of course, the ISS, which is also in orbit at the moment and which should be in service until roughly the end of the decade. So I think this about wraps up our list of the top eight trends and highlights of the Chinese space sector. I hope this was useful and this enlightened you on what was going on in the Chinese space sector. I think that definitely this was a very eventful year in the Chinese space sector. Um, and with that, I just want to wish our viewers a happy new year and to look forward to seeing you in 2022 and bringing you a lot of additional content on the Chinese space sector. Blaine, any closing comments for, for this year, 2021? All good from my side. Looking forward to, uh, to more coverage of some more interesting things next year. Thanks for watching.